In this video, I want to go through with you all about uh, how to recognize uh, types of intermolecular forces you have between two different compounds. If you imagine intermolecular forces as the kind of glue that sticks molecules together, all right, for example, for a molecule that's got such a small molecular weight, it's just one oxygen and two hydrogens, water has a very high boiling point, much higher than it should be. Uh, and that's something to do with the forces that stick the water molecules together. Those are called intermolecular forces, inter, because you're in between two molecules. And the three main types of intermolecular forces we're going to be talking about are hydrogen bonds, dipole-dipole, or dispersion. Now, hydrogen bonds are the strongest by far, then dipole-dipole dispersion are the weakest. I want to spend a few minutes and go through what each of these is. All right, and we're going to start with dispersion forces, the weakest of the bunch. So when we talk about dispersion forces, um, these are relegated simply to molecules that are non-polar. Now, if you watch my previous video, you'll know actually how to recognize if a molecule is nonpolar or not. So I'm not going to go through that again, although I, I will go through it a little bit when we start talking about some of the sample problems that I have here. So if you imagine that you've got two nonpolar molecules, and I'm just going to represent those as circles here. Now, although these molecules are nonpolar, all molecules are full of electrons, and really that's all molecules are, it's just electrons all around the place with nuclei right in the middle of uh, each of the elements. Now imagine what happens when you bring these two together, although they're nonpolar, they're all, they all consist of a whole bunch of electrons. Now you also know that electrons have a negative charge. And if I was to take this one nonpolar molecule and bring it closer to this one, so let's say that was what we had before, and now we have this afterwards, the electrons in this cloud are actually going to have an effect on the electrons in this cloud. If these are all negative and these are all negative, what you'll find is that a bunch of these electrons actually want to shift over to the other side of the molecule. They're going to be repelled by these other ones. And so what you're going to find is you have a larger number of electrons over here on this side than you had before. Now, as the electrons are negatively charged, what that means is you are going to build up a small negative charge and a small positive charge either side of this uh, molecule here. And because of that, you are going to build up a similar sort of charge here. So in effect, bringing these two together creates this small charge difference. Now, this is very, very small. So small, in fact, it means that dispersion forces are very, very weak. All right. If, if you think about gasoline, when you pour gasoline um, from the pump to your car, particularly on a hot day, you'll notice that the gasoline evaporates pretty quickly as it's coming out. If, if you spill some outside your tank, it evaporates very quickly. That's because its boiling point is very, very low. Because gasoline molecules are all nonpolar, so the only intermolecular forces between them, the things holding them together, their glue is dispersion forces, which is very, very, very weak. And if you've got a weak attraction between molecules, the boiling point is going to be very low. Hence why gasoline evaporates really quickly. If you spill water on the table somewhere, it doesn't evaporate anywhere near as quickly because its glue holding the molecules together is much, much stronger. Now, dipole, dipole. Uh, that is um, what you'll find in molecules that are polar. All right. And again, we've, we've been through what polar molecules are in a previous video. Um, and the best way to explain dipole-dipole is just to imagine if you have two molecules that are polar, for example, two molecules of um, acetone here. Actually, it doesn't really matter what the name is, but you've got these two molecules. The CO bond is a polar bond. In other words, there is a, there is a dipole here. can represent the dipole either as 
the two delta plus and delta minus charges, or you can represent it as a dipole arrow. It doesn't really matter with the arrow or the negative pointing towards the more electronegative element. If we have two of those, and each of them has the same uh, charge separation, then what you're going to find is the negative end of one is going to be attracted to the positive end of the other. And that is what a dipole-dipole attraction is. It's stronger than a dispersion um, attraction. Because this charge separation was already there before these two came together. This one was not. So if you imagine dipole-dipole is kind of like if you have a couple of bar magnets. I'm sure you use bar magnets, bar magnets in your high school physics class. If you put two of these bar magnets together like that, they will attract each other. If you put them together like this, with the same charges facing each other, of course, they'll repel each other. So they'll repel. But if you bring them together like this, they will attract each other. And that's what's going on here. That's a dipole-dipole attraction. Now, hydrogen bonds are a very specific type of dipole-dipole attraction, but they're quite a bit stronger. As you imagine, hydrogen is, is, is in the name, so it's something to do with hydrogen. You have to have hydrogen connected to a particularly a directly connected to an electronegative element and a, and a small electronegative element. The only three that are small enough that we're going to be concerned about are N, O, or F. So you've got to have hydrogen directly connected to either one of these three elements in order to have <coughs> hydrogen bonds present. So imagine that we've got some water, for example. It's a structure of water. It's supposed to be a pair of bloody electrons there. Hang on. This damn thing. Sorry, I didn't just say damn. Well, okay, I did. I'll just say it again. I oh, will. All right, so here's our water. Um, and notice here we've got oxygen directly connected to hydrogen. And then I draw, say, another molecule of this acetone guy that we have here. Now, <clears throat> The first, th the main thing that you need is you need nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine present in both of your molecules for hydrogen bonds to be possible. Oxygen has to be directly connected to hydrogen or nitrogen or fluorine in one of those two. It doesn't matter which. It can be in both, but it has to be in at least one. If it's directly connected, then we have this dipole set up here. And we also have this dipole set up here. But the thing that makes this different is hydrogen is so small and its charge density is what it is that the dipole-dipole attraction here between the negatively charged oxygen and the positively charged teeny tiny hydrogen is very strong. Stronger than in dipole-dipole because whenever you're talking about dipole-dipole, you are not usually talking about hydrogen. So as I said, hydrogen bonds are a very specific type of dipole-dipole attraction where hydrogen is directly involved. <clears throat> so those are the three types of um, intermolecular forces. And what we'll do is we will go through a several different molecules, and I'll go through and tell you and show you what the answer is in each case. And the answer is going to be either hydrogen bonds, dipole, dipole, or dispersion. It's going to be one of those three. So when we go to this guy first, it always helps, it always helps to draw the structure out for your molecules before you do anything else. Because if you don't know the structure, for example, you can't tell if, you know, for example, is hydrogen directly connected to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine. Sometimes with a formula, you can't tell that. Now, of course, in this, in this case, we, we clearly don't have that problem because there's no oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine present. So that means hydrogen bonds are definitely out. And then what we have to ask ourselves here is, well, are these molecules polar or non-polar? That's the only thing we need to know. If hydrogen bonds are out, is it polar or non-polar? Now, as you've been through before, and um, you can figure out if a molecule is nonpolar or polar. All carbon hydrogen bonds are nonpolar, which means both of these molecules are completely nonpolar. And if both of them are completely nonpolar, there is no way for us to have 
dipole is present, so therefore dipole dipole is not an option. That means the only possible answer here is dispersion forces, and that's what you'll see for any time you have two molecules that are nonpolar. Let's have a look at this, CH4 and Br2. So I'm going to draw out CH4 again. That's exactly what it was before. And I'm going to draw out bromine as well. And again, we have to ask ourselves the same question we asked before. Polar or nonpolar? Because again, we can see there's no oxygen directly connected to hydrogen, to no hydrogen directly to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine here. So hydrogen bonding is out. We know methane. CH4 is nonpolar. We saw that in the last question. When we look at a molecule like bromine and we look at the polarity of this bond, well, whenever you have two atoms of exactly the same element, their electronegativities are exactly the same, so they completely cancel out. So that makes this nonpolar as well. If you have a nonpolar molecule and a nonpolar molecule coming into contact with each other, as you had here, whether they're the same molecule or not, if both of those are nonpolar, the only possible answer is dispersion forces between these two. So these attractive forces would be very, very weak. Now, when we go here, CH3 and H2O, we've got a bit more complicated situation because we've got oxygen, hydrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. So hydrogen bonding could be a possibility. So we need to make sure that we draw these structures out. Now, H2O, we know what the structure is for that. In fact, I drew it out here. So I'm going to draw it out the same way here. And we know for a fact that here, from drawing the structure out, there's oxygen directly connected to hydrogen. And <coughs> so we need to draw the structure of this guy out as well. <coughs> and I'm going to draw it out down here. So usually when I draw these structures out, draw the formulas out, I give you kind of a clue as to what the connectivity is. And notice that the, the connectivity here is actually very similar to what I showed up here. Now. So when, when we draw this out, let me just fix this load of bollocks there. I don't know what happened. All right. So here we have these two. These are the structures of these. Notice in both cases, we have oxygen directly connected to hydrogen. So and that means we have this dipole involving hydrogen here and this dipole involving hydrogen here. So we have a... <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. We have this dipole-dipole attraction um, between this oxygen and this hydrogen, but we also have a similar one between this oxygen and this hydrogen. All right, and th there is even a particular attraction between this oxygen and this hydrogen. So we've got a bunch of dipoles here, but remember we said. Whenever you have a dipole-dipole attraction involving hydrogen in particular, that makes a hydrogen bond. So therefore, we have hydrogen bonds as our strongest intermolecular force here. So the glue between these two would actually be pretty strong, much stronger than for these two or these two. All right, so let's, let's go to this last one, CH3OH and CH3Cl. Well, the CH3OH is going to be exactly what it was before, so I'm just going to draw that out here. And there's my CH3OH. And what I'm going to draw out here is my CH3, except rather than OH, we have a Cl here. There's three long pairs on the Cl. Let me just fix that. Bollocks again. These are our two structures, all right? We have our dipole here. We've also got plus charge on the carbon. Now here, carbon-hydrogen bonds are all nonpolar. We saw that earlier on. We do have this dipole, though, because chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. The thing that's different about this one versus this case here is we, we have an oxygen directly connected to a hydrogen here, which means hydrogen bonding could be a possibility. But we don't have N, O, or F in this molecule. Because of that, 
hydrogen bonding has no choice but to be out because of no nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine here. However, both these molecules are polar because they have dipoles in them. So therefore, if they're polar, clearly dispersion is not a possibility. That actually only leaves us with one possibility, which is dipole-dipole. And we can represent that by simply saying, well, there's going to be an attraction between, for example, the chlorine and the hydrogen, the negative to positive. There could be an attraction between the chlorine to the carbon, again, another positive negative, between the oxygen and the carbon, a third positive negative attraction. However, each of those is an example of a dipole dipole attraction. And so that is what the answer is for this last pair of molecules. So all you need to know is can I draw the structure of each of my molecules out? Can I draw them out and figure out if they're nonpolar or polar? And if I can, that's all I need to know. And that is how you